Hi, my name is Ken Davidian, and welcome to Organization Theory in Space, Season 2, where each week I'm coming out with a video on each chapter in the Oxford Handbook, Organizational Change and Innovation, Second Edition, edited by Marshall Scott Poole and Andy Vandeven. This week, we're covering Chapter 9 of the Handbook entitled Social Movement and Organizational Change. In this chapter, we'll talk about why there is recent work to merge theories of social movements and organizational change. We'll briefly cover three different types of movements, the social movement synthesis model, the different types of changes resulting from social movements, and finally, the strengths and limitations of social movement research. The chapter starts out by asserting that now is a good time to rethink both social movements and organizational change theories. Social movements research are rooted in the fields of political science and sociology. However, recent advances in information technologies, shifts in values, and the low or negligible transaction costs of information flows all need to be incorporated into existing theories in this field. Similarly, New aspects of starting and running organizations, such as lower transaction costs and acquiring and coordinating resources entirely online, is increasingly feasible. So organizational change research, which is typically conducted in business and management schools, also needs updating to incorporate all these new developments. There's been talk about erasing the boundaries between these academic domains since the 1970s, as scholars recognize the analogies between states and organizations. Recently, increases in scale, pervasiveness, and success of social movements are driving the political science, sociology, and business and management fields toward each other more than ever. We mentioned that there are three different types of social movements. These are movements within organizations, movements that target organizations, and movements that help create or facilitate organizations. Regarding the first of these, social movements within organizations create a situation where challengers operate at high personal risk. Because of this, the existence of relational spaces are very important. These are safe spaces needed to form a unified structure and message about the change before going public. Also helpful are opportunity structures, which are conditions that increase the early chances of success of the movement and reduce the personal risk to challengers. Opportunity structures can include leadership becoming more sympathetic or a change in the political environment. It's not surprising that organized movements have more power than movements driven by an individual, resulting in lower risk to any one person. Finally, the tactics available to challengers are influenced by overlapping personal and organizational relationships. The second type of movement movements targeting organizations can be initiated by books, movies, or other cultural artifacts, or by significant events. There are some factors that affect the success of social movements, including the involvement of shareholders versus the involvement of outsiders in affecting change. Also, influencing a firm's political and regulatory environment is more effective than engaging in protests or boycotts. Although, Boycotts and other campaigns by outsiders can still be effective when target firms are particularly vulnerable. For example, when their stock prices are low. The success of social movements is also enhanced if change agents target the internal polity, such as the status of the firm's executives, undermining their unity or increasing the perceived risk of investing in the firm. Finally, if the firm's upstream and downstream chain actors low level of understanding about the nature and attributes of the products being protested, then the social movement can have a higher chance of success. Obviously, this tactic is more successful for firms and industries that are not vertically integrated. Lastly, movements can create or enable organizations, both directly or indirectly. In the past, social movements used cultural codes to shape a new market or activity, creating alternative supplier distribution channels, and attracting and directing entrepreneurial activities. The example given in the book is the encouragement of new entrepreneurial companies to, com 
complete the commodity chain, enabling the grass-fed beef industry. Groups of firms can also differentiate their products via social movements, via such as was done in the example of differentiating certified wood products from managed forests, as opposed to other wood products that came from potentially illegal deforestation activities. Third, new industries can emerge as an indirect result of social movements that target some other industries, as was the case in the development and emergence of the soft drink industry, resulting from prohibition reforms in the United States in the early 20th century. And finally, social movements can enable the emergence of new types of organizations as happened when the anti-corporate Grange movement encouraged the creation of cooperatives. To better analyze social movements, the social movement synthesis model is used to ask when, why, who, and how questions about change activities. The questions of when refer to the opportunity structure mentioned earlier. This includes the broad contours of social context and recent events that affect and modify the feasibility of purposeful change at a given moment. The why questions pertain to framing the issues and the fitness of the communications to a particular organization's culture. The who question refers to the social networks of agents who will push for social changes. These networks need to be wonk meaning they need to have a cause that is worthy, unified, numerous, and committed to the cause. Finally, the how question alludes to the structures of change, including the technological, social, and physical systems required to mobilize action. Social movements work to create different types of changes and in organizational innovations. The first are changes to products and services to create and extend value beyond profit to include social welfare. The second type of changes are to processes, working to make organizational operations more sustainable or equitable in some way. Thirdly are changes in people management, making a just and rewarding workplace for all involved. The last type of change is to communities, working to engage change beyond the walls of the organization. Of course, social movement research has its strengths and limits. Its strengths include a focus on real change, meaning changes to processes and mechanisms rather than simple mechanical rules for bringing about change. Successful movements are not simple actions, but require a series of activity phases. And since social movements are more and more mobilized online, that means there is a large amount of data available to researchers, making new and larger scale comparative studies possible. Similarly, Data availability is also a limitation of social movement research since internal movements are less visible than highly publicized and external change efforts. Finally, there is always a limitation of left, tail, of left tail bias, the fact that we tend to research successful social movement efforts and ignore those that were not successful. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Organization Theory in Space. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you consider subscribing to the Impossible Research YouTube channel. And until next week, see you later. OT in Space was produced by IRL, which stands for Impossible Research LLC. IRL conducts process research on the topics of innovation and industry emergence within the space sector context. IRL also offers services of organization theory consulting, research consulting, and STEAM outreach. This video is intended for educational purposes only.